I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. And uh, we're going to begin reading at verse 27, down through verse 32. Excuse me, Luke 5, verses 27 down through verse 32. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he left all and rose up and followed him. And Levi made a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Levi is Matthew. He wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew wrote about this same event in his Gospel, in uh, Matthew chapter 9, when he decided to follow Jesus Christ. Mark also recorded this particular event, Mark chapter 2. But I chose Luke's account because of my theme today. Luke comes from the Latin word lux, meaning light. And by derivation, the name Luke means giving light. However, Lucifer also means a light bearer. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. There's an important distinction that needs to be made between someone who genuinely gives the light of Jesus Christ and somebody who's offering an artificial or a counterfeit light, which Satan does. Luke is a prominent figure in the New Testament. Even though we're not given a lot of detail about him, he's the author of this gospel and also of the book of Acts. He identifies himself as the author of both books in Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Paul names him in Philemon, the little book of Philemon, verse 24, as Lucas, one of his fellow laborers. Uh, Luke wrote the book of Acts, and he indicates that he was traveling with the Apostle Paul in those missionary journeys. He wrote Acts 16, verse 10, and after he, Paul, had seen the vision, immediately, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, so forth and so on. Acts 16, verse 17. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God. Acts 20, verse 5. These going before tarried for us at Troas, and other references in the book of Acts. Otherwise, we don't know much about the identity and the background of Luke, except that Paul calls him Luke, Lucas, or Luke, the beloved physician, Colossians 4, verse 14. And just before Paul's death, he wrote to his disciple Timothy, only Luke is with me. 2 Timothy 4, verse 11. One of his most trusted and faithful companions in the ministry. Nearly all of church history agrees that Luke was a medical doctor, of the first century. That's why I chose his account of Matthew's conversion here in Luke 5. Luke tells us that it was Matthew or Levi who made the feast or organized the feast in his own home. Matthew didn't even admit that in his own account. Luke reported more of Jesus' physical miracles than the other three gospel writers did. Matthew, Mark, or John. And he was the perfect one chosen by God to write all the events that, which unfolded in the book of Acts in the early days of the Christian church. Because Luke was a physician, 
I want to consider what the Bible says today about your health. Now, for the purposes of full disclosure, I'm not a doctor, right? I'm not a medical professional. We say, I work during the week in a funeral home. We say we sort of follow the medical profession. You have to think about that. There was a, uh, a lady and a, a gentleman sitting in a restaurant, and they were about to sit down and have their dinner, and the lady's dentures were loose. They weren't fitting right. And uh, she was complaining to her husband, what am I going to do? I can't enjoy my dinner. The man in the next booth is well-dressed, and he said, uh, listen, I overheard your problem. Maybe I can help. He, he has a, a briefcase. He opens it up, and he sorts through some uh, dental work there. He says, here, try these. He gives her a pair of dentures. She puts them in her mouth, perfect fit. And she says, that's great. Are you a doctor or a dentist? He says, no, I'm an undertaker. <laughs> but Luke was the perfect one. And um, I'm going to borrow a question heard in a lot of old movies. And I titled this sermon, Is There a Doctor in the House? Is there a doctor in the house? This won't be outlined very well as, as much as it will be a number of observations made uh, along these lines today. Observation number one, let me say this, the Bible is not against medical doctors. Many Christians are. But notice Jesus' own words, verse 31, they that are whole need not a physician, but they uh, which are sick, but they that are sick. Uh, if Christ himself, God in the flesh, the creator of the human body, endorsed the general need for medical doctors, then why do so many believers these days want to criticize them? Why are they so opposed to them? We don't trust them. Uh, why do so many believers think the medical field is, or the medical uh, business is simply a ruse to conceal their true agenda, Right? some sort of space alien hybrid project, perhaps, or some nefarious control of the human race. Well, they're only in it for money. Who isn't, right? The guy that sells the cars, he's in it to make money. The person at the grocery store wants to make money. The kid at Starbucks wants to make money. Money is a necessary part of life, and the more years you spend training for a field, um, and you go into great debt to get to that point, eight years of medical uh, uh, study, and maybe f several more years uh, to enter a, a specialty, you expect to be rewarded eventually. And uh, if there are not a whole lot of people doing what you do, specializing in what you specialize in, then you have a right to charge more than the, the guy who's simply an eye, ears, nose, and throat practitioner. So who begrudges someone to make a decent living if they're rendering a decent service? But the Bible's not against doctors or physicians. And the word physician shows up first in Genesis chapter 50, verse 2. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel, or Jacob. The medical practice wasn't developed very far in Egypt if the physicians were also the morticians. Uh, they were experts at preserving dead bodies, but weren't very good at healing living bodies. When Job was going through his afflictions, his three friends were of no comfort. They could offer no advice for Job to follow. And he told them, ye are all physicians of no value, Job 13, verse 4. Fortunately, uh, in modern times, we have medical doctors and specialists who are of very great value. We should actually thank God for it. And uh, we benefit from them. In our church, we've had medical doctors and medical nurses, a Western 
medicine practitioners. And we also have Eastern medicine practitioners. We have a couple of uh, licensed, uh, trained uh, uh, acupuncturists in our congregation now. I've, I appreciate them both. And uh, the Bible doesn't take sides in the Eastern-Western medicine debate. So um, I, I, it's not my, I don't have the freedom to say, well, this is right and that's wrong, or that's wrong, uh, that's right and this is wrong. Whatever gets the job done is what you need to do, when you need to practice. So I've um, availed myself of some of our church members who practice acupuncture, acupressure, and uh, and frankly, maybe I didn't um, try it often enough to see or measure the benefits. However, uh, there was no uh, side effects, no negative side effects from it, and I appreciate them all. The Bible doesn't take sides in that debate. But the Bible is not against medical doctors. Observation number two, the Bible's not against medicine. Jeremiah prophesied that Israel would be restored back to their land following their captivity in Babylon, and by association, be restored to their land after 2,000 years of being dispersed throughout the nations. And we, modern times, have witnessed that take place. Uh, he also reminded them that the false gods they had resorted to previously would be of no help. Quote, For thus saith the Lord, Thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause, that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. Jeremiah 30, verses 12 and 13. And the Word of God prescribes medicine in at least two specific places. Proverbs 17, verse 22, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to elaborate on this, but you can find some good articles about the uh, demonstrable and proven benefits of laughter. One article I saw stated that nothing works faster as an antidote for stress, pain, and conflict than a good laugh. I think that's true, right? If symptoms persist, uh, watch a little bit of Laurel and Hardy, maybe the Three Stooges, uh, check out some of Bob Newhart's early stuff, you'll, you'll roll in the aisle laughing. Uh, laughter decreases stress hormones, it increases the immune cell system, it boosts blood flow, uh, yet it relaxes the entire body, and it triggers the release of uh, endorphins. It's a natural uh, chemical inside every person that calms down your mood, makes you feel happy, it makes you feel better. And the Bible was right 3,000 years ago, and medical science is just still catching up with the Word of God. In the New Testament, Paul told Timothy, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. 1 Timothy 5, verse 23. Notice Paul didn't tell Timothy to stop drinking water and only drink wine. But he said, Use a little wine for its medical benefit. And since the Bible doesn't distinguish between fermented and unfermented, you can't use that text to justify alcoholic wine either, my friend. Nice try. But the Bible isn't against medicine. Many Christians are. And um, many believers will order something they saw on a late-night infomercial before they'll get the prescription filled the doctor gave them. Thinking that'll, and they'll wonder why they're still sick. And... Uh, a few weeks ago, I preached a series of sermons on the, the benefits that can come from suffering. And I admitted in my own uh, case, I've been dealing with esophageal cancer for the last two years. I've been trusting the City of Hope and the oncologists there with chemotherapy. And I don't think there, there's some sort of secret conspiracy between them and the drug manufacturers to just push a certain medicine, that's what they've been trained to do, and Western medicine approaches the disease differently than Eastern medicine. However, I don't think there's some secret conspiracy that, that's, I had a guy comment under one of those sermons, 
saying that chemotherapy is simply a form of population control. So I emailed, I, I replied to him, and you can find the, the reply under the, the comments under, I think, the, the second sermon, that um, as far as I can tell, chemotherapy has actually cured more people of cancer than all the herbal remedies and acupressure than massage therapy or anything else, any other quack nostrum you could recommend. And if it's a form of population control, they're doing it wrong. If you don't know the um, degree of my, or you don't, if you don't know the status of my case, you don't know what treatment protocols I've been under, you don't know anything more about my uh, condition, you really don't know anything at all. Educate yourself. And, uh, but it's amazing how, how quick people will run to you and say, well, I heard that this thing cures cancer. You want to ask them, what kind of cancer? Skin cancer? Melanoma? Lung cancer? Brain tumors? What kind of cancer does it cure? Where's the documentation? They just hear this phrase, well, it cures cancer. What kind? Be more specific. So, but they'll do that. And once again, the Eastern Western approaches uh, each have their benefits uh, or their limitations. Observation number three, let me say this. The Bible knew more than the ancient world knew. I'll give you a few examples. Skeptics, atheists accuse the Bible of being nothing but folklore and mythology, and the Old Testament Jews of being ignorant. They didn't know about microorganisms. They didn't know about the spread of disease and germs. But consider what they did know. They understood how babies were made, and the seed came from the father in conception. You read Genesis 38, and what became known as the sin of Onan, Onanism, O-N-A-N-I-S-M, the sin of Onanism is described there, and I'm not going to elaborate on it. Some of the Bible is intended for private reading. But they understood where babies came from. And they knew that what an expected mother ate, the unborn baby would receive. This, is, this was clear in the case of Samson. His mother was told not to eat anything that came from the vine or the vine tree or anything, any grapes. He would be a, a Nazarite from conception, from his birth. Judges chapter 3. Newborn males were said to be circumcised. On the eighth day following birth, Genesis 17, verse 12. A vitamin K, also known as uh, throm uh, prothrombin, which fights uh, against excessive hemorrhaging, is at its highest level on the eighth day of birth following the, or following the birth of a male. In fact, it's the highest level in that baby's bloodstream uh, as, as it'll ever be in its entire life. Funny how God knew exactly what day to command it on. The Center for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, now recommends circumcision as a way of preventing disease and the spread of disease, especially in um, developing countries, third world countries where the sanitation conditions are not always ideal. God instructed the Jews to dig latrines outside their camp to keep the camp clean, Deuteronomy chapter 23. The blood drained away from the animals and the sacrifices was to be buried, not just left out in the open to attract all sorts of um, disease and, and infection and spread contagion. Leviticus 17, verse 13. And those with possible signs of leprosy were to be quarantined for observation. Leviticus chapter 13. Those who were sick were told to cover their mouths and announce themselves unclean when a stranger approached to prevent airborne contagion. You see people uh, wearing respirator masks now when they have a cold to present, prevent uh, catching anything worse or spreading it to someone else. And uh, they might feel embarrassed wearing it. I know a lady, her daughter wears it to school just for fun, even if she's not sick. She just thinks it's a fashion statement. <laughs> She's a little bit touched, but uh, 
But, I, you know, you appreciate someone that, that is mindful of other people in doing so. And uh, the person, any clothing that was contaminated was to be incinerated, according to Leviticus chapter 13, verse 52. The person who was judged clean was to bathe his flesh in running water, Leviticus chapter 15, verse 13. Not stagnant water, not in a basin of water, but in running water. Running water flushes out impurities. Beside those instructions, God gave them their dietary rules, Leviticus 11. You know, an animal that um, had a cloven hoof, like a pig or a swine, was unclean. They were not allowed to eat. An animal that partially digests its food and then spits it up again later from the stomach to chew it again, like a rabbit, uh, camels do it, other animals do it, that animal was considered unclean. But an animal that did both was considered clean, like a, a cattle and deer, those are clean animals. And uh, and, and other um, stipulations. But you can get on the internet right now and find some very good articles about the, the health benefits of a kosher diet. They didn't have to understand microorganisms and the, the spread of disease and germs and germ theory. They had to do what they were told. And the health benefits would accrue to them just the same. So the ancient, uh, the Bible knew more than the ancient world knew at the time. Observation number four, let me say this. Doctors are not perfect. Doctors are not perfect. We read in Mark chapter 5, verse 26, about a woman with a blood issue. She had endured this for 12 years, the Bible says, and it records she had, quote, suffered many things of many physicians. They were probably experimenting with her. Let's see if this works. Let's see if that works. And had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. Doctors can miss the true cause of someone's problem. They can misdiagnose a sickness or an ailment. But you and I should thank God that they're right more often than they're wrong these days. And every one of us uh, has benefited from them. If you break your arm, you don't want herbal remedies, right? You don't want just... a uh, psychological counseling. You don't want um, massage therapy. You don't want to, you know, drink more apple cider vinegar. That, that won't help. You know, adding more sea salt to your diet won't help. If you break your arm, you're not worried about lilac or uh, lavender oils, you know, and all that stuff. You want a doctor that can set that arm correctly. I discovered I had diabetes when I was 14 years old, 1975, and I've been on insulin every day for the last 44 years, which is strange since I'm only 37 years old. My teeth were crooked, so my parents had me wear braces. See? Uh, I've had cataract surgeries in both eyes detached retina repair, and more laser treatments than I can count. And yet, I can still see, I can still read, I can still work, I can still drive, thank the Lord. I had a cancerous tumor and a kidney that needed to be removed a few years back. And like I say, I'm currently dealing with uh, esophageal cancer. I owe my life to doctors. And if the truth be told, many of you do too. You wouldn't be here were it not for the attention and the recommendation and the good treatment of a doctor. Christ said, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But it's true that doctors aren't perfect. They still make mistakes and you can't rely solely on medical science. That's why we call uh, our God the great physician, right? Doctors are only practicing medicine, but we have a God who's the great physician in heaven. And we read in 2 Chronicles 16, verses 12 and 13, 
And Asa, the king of Judah, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. If you're suffering a medical crisis, that's the time to get closer to God than you've ever been. Actually, when you wake up uh, and get out of your bed, that's the time to get closer to God than you were the day before. But we don't go through life thinking that. Suddenly we get in a panic when we have an emergency or some medical uh, thing befalls us. And we're wondering, what do I do? Where do I turn? Where can I go to to get the, the help I need? You can't smoke cigarettes or a pack a day for 25, 30 years or longer, develop emphysema, and then get angry at God. Uh, nor can you expect some miracle cure like that. The bodies function, the bodies work in a certain way, and everyone's body operate, functions largely the same as the next guy's. Except the intervention of God in some miraculous way, uh, you're going to suffer for that. And people go through life with, with um, the wrong expectations of medical science and medical doctors, thinking they can cure everything. Doctors cannot cure everything. They can't even diagnose everything correctly, let alone cure it. But if you're suffering a medical crisis, that's the time to get closer to God than ever before. Start reading your Bible once again if you've been neglecting it. Paul describes the washing of water by the Word, Ephesians 5, 26. One conclusion will eventually lead to another conclusion. You need to be well hydrated, drink plenty of water. It boosts your strength, it boosts your stamina, it reduces headaches, it decreases the risk of kidney stones and even the risk of constipation. And it'll help you lose weight. How many want to lose weight? Never mind. Psalm 40 verse 3 says, and he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. Music can either promote rebellion against God. Think of the Jews naked, dancing around the golden calf, singing in Exodus 32. Or it can promote calm and peace. Think of David playing for King Saul and the evil spirits departing from him. 1 Samuel chapter 16. It's called music therapy. And it's used even today. A pleasant music can help lower stress, reduce depression, help you eat less food. You know why you go into a, a Burger King or McDonald's, some fast food restaurant? They've spent money studying how to get customers to buy more food. All the color schemes are orange, yellow, red. Those colors seem to stimulate your appetite. And you're sitting in their little restaurant there. You're hearing sort of a lively music, a fast mood. That stimulates your, your desire to eat more as well. If you lower the lights, put on calm music, you'll tend to eat less. And then if you're looking for a romantic dinner, that's a good way to do it too, right? But pleasant music can relax patients before and after surgery. It'll improve memory. It improves the memory of stroke victims and even helps the memory of Alzheimer's patients and help you sleep better at night and even increase your IQ. It helps you sleep better at night because in a way, soothing music helps cleanse the soul of everything that's been put into it during the day before. And it should be self-evident that some music is better at affecting those benefits than other music. You'd have to be mentally deficient to not see that. Ephesians 5.19, Paul writes, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Well, the psalms are the psalms. Hymns are any song written specifically for the praise of God. And spiritual songs would be anything that lifts the spirit. Find something that lifts the spirit uh, and enjoy it. There are also studies on the mental and physical benefits 
of reading and listening to poetry. And like I say, you can find these online articles. There's a certain tempo, a certain cadence to good poetry that improves your vocabulary and also organizes complex subjects into a very succinct form. It makes it more easy to uh, comprehend and memorize and to understand. And for us, what's more poetic than the King James Bible? The Word of God. The King James Bible, I told a guy yesterday, the King James Bible represents the, the developmental apex of the English language. It's the most refined form the English language ever took uh, between the covers of one book. Paul writes in Colossians 3, verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That has a, a, a wonderful tempo and a rhythm to it. Listen to that same verse in Kenneth Taylor's Living Bible. Since you became alive again, so to speak, when Christ arose from the dead, now set your sights on the rich treasures and joys of heaven where he sits beside God in the place of honor and power, unquote. The King James translators used 22 words to convey that thought. Uh, Kenneth Taylor required 38 words in his text, and it still fell flat. It's not memorable at all. It didn't have the desired effect on the, on the soul and the spirit of the person reading it. And, but you can't depend on medical science alone. If you're a believer, you need God's help. You need God's help. Doctors aren't perfect. Observation number five, let me say this. Charismatics are frauds. Say, boy, you sure switched subject matter. Yeah, but it's kind of all linked together. I'll, I'll get to it in a moment here. Charismatics are frauds. Some churches have a sign out front that says, Healing and Miracle Service, 7 p.m. How do you schedule that? How do you know there's going to be healing and miracles take place at 7 p.m.? You don't. The prophet Elisha sent a message to Naaman, the Syrian, the captain of the Syrian army, who was a leper. Told him to go wash in the Jordan River, he'd get healed. Naaman comes with his entourage. He's outside Elisha's house waiting for Elisha to come do something. And he simply sends him a message, tells him, go tell uh, Naaman, go wash in the Jordan River. He'll get better. And Naaman thought it couldn't be that simple. 2 Kings 5, verse 11 says, But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand on the, over the place and recover the leper. He was expecting some dramatic display, some show, but Elisha didn't even come out of the house to talk to him. Pastor Benny Hinn wears a white suit at his rallies. They lower the house lights and the spotlight follows him back and forth on the stage. It's to create, and the, the organist is sitting there watching him, ready to interject some dramatic music at different, different points during the meeting. And it's to create this illusion that he's a holy man, and something spiritual and something miraculous is about to take place, and nothing takes place. Uh, I'm going to recommend something I don't, I don't know if I've ever done this before, but let me recommend something that you, you certainly enjoy watching. You might get a good laugh out of it, too. NBC, of course, Dateline did a whole expose, a two-part expose on Benny Hinn a few years ago, about six, seven years ago. And talk about the lifestyles of the rich and the famous, but, and, the, and the charlatan act, the, the phony, uh, fake miracles that supposedly take place on the stage. And one of Benny Hinn's rallies, he had a guy... Fall, people were in the healing line waiting to get up on stage and one guy fell on top of another guy in the line, broke the guy's back. Benny didn't help him. He called for an ambulance, right? But check this out. If you have the internet, go to YouTube. It's called Leap of Faith. Benny Hinn 
a dangerous fake. It's a, it was a story of his uh, campaign in Australia, and the Australian network did a very good um, expose on him. Leap of Faith, Benny Hinn, a dangerous fake. Check that out. Oral Roberts had a tent uh, collapse on one of his miracle crusades back in 1950. Injured 50 people. Did Oral get, in, get there and start healing them? And no, they called for an ambulance and 50 people had to be taken to the hospital. And Dr. Ruckman used to point out, why heal somebody um, you know, if you have the gift of healing, why call an ambulance? If Oral Roberts, he claimed that he had the power of God flowing through his right hand, he'd laid it on over two million people during his ministry and healed them. And yet when it came time where people actually needed healing, he couldn't do anything for them. Twenty years ago, I was working for a funeral home right here in Ontario, California. We had a gentleman we were making funeral plans for, and we we're going to bury this gentleman. This man had a nice man from all for all accounts, but he had severe osteoporosis, curvature of the spine, and uh, and I'm not trying to make fun of him, it was, but it was common knowledge, so I'm not really embarrassed. I'm not going to give his name. But he was stooped over so far, he was staring at the ground, and he walked around Ontario for 40 years in that condition. At the viewing, when we laid this gentleman in his casket, his body was so contorted, it had the appearance of someone who was sitting up in bed because of the shape of his body. And his son was about my age, and he said, you know, Mike, I know it looks strange, but that's the only way I ever knew my dad. And I said, listen, you don't have to say that to me. We, we see a lot of different things naturally in this business, but you don't have to apologize for me. The very next day at this gentleman's funeral, a little church here in Ontario, who should show up at the funeral but Oral Roberts and his wife, Evelyn Roberts. They flew out here from Oklahoma to attend this man's funeral. This man was Evelyn Roberts' younger brother. The man's pastor didn't even know he was related to Oral Roberts. But Oral Roberts, the world's most famous healing evangelist, hadn't been able to do anything for that guy all of those years. I mean, I knew he was a fake, but it helped me to see that firsthand. And Oral had just had eye surgery at his hospital in Tulsa. It was doubtful whether he'd make it out to the funeral in time, but he was able to come. Well, listen, if you have the, the power of healing flowing through your right hand, do like the Three Stooges or Laurel Hardy and heal yourself. If you have the, the gift of healing, you don't need to build a hospital. You go through... And you don't need to ask for money. Go in and heal some rich guys. They'll give you all the money you need. You'll get all the publicity you need for free. But they don't speak in tongues. Not really. They don't speak in uh, tongues biblically. They rattle off a bunch of gibberish and nonsensical phrases that mean nothing. There's no syntax to it. There's no system. There's no orderliness to it. And uh, in the book of Acts, all the languages, or all the, the tongues the apostles spoke in Acts chapter 2 were all foreign languages. They're listed right there in Acts chapter 2. They didn't speak in some incoherent gibberish. So they don't speak in tongues, and they don't have the power to heal. Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Jesse Duplantis, uh, anybody else like that, they're all frauds. They're all fakes. Every last one of them. And if you get sucked in by that, you deserve to have your money taken from you. You'll go there expecting a miracle, and all you're going to receive is a, a lighter wallet when you leave. 
Back in our first text this morning, observe Luke chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And observation number six, this will be the last one I make today. There's something worse than sickness. There's something worse than sickness. Back in chapter four, Christ was rejected um, even among his own family members and his own hometown. He said in chapter four, verse 23, ye shall surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. Some people would be so distracted by the physical miracles, the healing miracles Jesus was doing, they wouldn't see the bigger picture. Uh, in our text, he likens himself to a doctor, and the greatest sickness, the greatest disease, is sin. Sin. He came to call sinners to repentance. Can you admit to God that you're a sinner? Do you have any remorse or any shame, sorrow about your sin? If so, God has something good he wants to do for you. We believe in healing. We believe God still heals people that are sick. And um, we pray for those that are sick. And we, uh, we've often seen God restore somebody and make them well. And all we've been able to do is pray. But more importantly, God wants to forgive sinners. He wants to save their souls. God wants you to spend eternity with Him in glory. He wants you to be with Him. The prophet Isaiah wrote, But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, verse 5. Right now, you get your sins forgiven. You'll get your new body later. They say uh, all good things come to those who wait. So you have to be patient for it. This life, uh, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more eternal and exceeding weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So you get your sins forgiven now, you'll get a new body later. You just have to be patient for it. Wait for it. And the Bible declares, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If all have sinned, then all need to be forgiven. All need to be saved. All need to be uh, reconciled to God. All need to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. That can happen that fast when you trust Him as your Savior. That included me, that includes you. Now, I've trusted Christ as my Savior. What about you? Do you know for sure that you've trusted Jesus Christ to be your Savior? Let me speak to those watching online. Do you know for sure that if you died right now, you'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ? If there's a single doubt in your mind, then why not right now say, God, I admit I'm a sinner. I know that I can't save myself but I believe Jesus died in my place, was punished for my sins. And in the best way I know how, I'm asking that he would, his righteousness would become mine, you'd save my soul, all my sins would be put on him, and that great spiritual transaction Pastor Shrive talks about can take place. Save my soul, God, forgive my sins. Make me a Christian in a, a real permanent way for all of eternity. God will do it for you just like he did it for me.